is how I love you. Here I am before you, longing to be close to know you more. Hear the cry of my heart, the struggle to surrender. Come and take your place, take every part.
how high, how deep How deep This love that covers me Oceans deep, this mystery How wide, long and how high, how deep And how wide is your embrace
Jesus, how I love you. Here I you're visiting us today for the first time you're saying who's this uh, my name's Chris I'm the pastor I'm going to be sharing this morning on uh, the subject of prophecy and I want to try and do it justice in a very very short period of time it is something you could speak a whole conference on it's something the prophetic gift is something that is coming alive in the body of Christ or at least um, in small parts of the body of Christ right now so I want to share a dream. I, I said several months ago that I wanted to share dreams and visions and revelation um, that people just in our church have been having and to give, before we, I, I share this dream from Becca, just to give it um, some kind of uh, backdrop and an understanding of prophecy. So the, the prophecy, let me just begin with uh, where we begin really, which is the outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost. Jesus has died, he's now resurrected, he's now seated at the right hand of his Father. He told the disciples, wait for me, uh, don't begin witnessing. I know you've seen me, I know that you know I'm resurrected, but you need power from on high. And that power came on the day of Pentecost to the 120 and it transformed them. It transformed in particular Peter, who was a broken person really before this event and and he gave this awesome speech on the day of Pentecost that converted thousands of people. I'll say this as well, while we're on this subject, you know, um, that God is into converting thousands and is doing so in parts of the world. But the gospel, the posh word here is efficacious. It means that when we, we preach Jesus under the power of the Holy Spirit, people believe in him. And they believe in him not because of wise and persuasive words. They believe in him because the power of the Spirit brings witness and conviction and transformation to the people hearing. Oh my, oh my, do we need lots of preachers to preach this gospel in this country. And so in Acts chapter 2, he says, In the last days I'll pour out my Spirit on all people. He's quoting from the prophet Joel. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men uh, will dream dreams. And even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. There's the launch of the church, the launch the, to be able to, if you like, to put and frame what the Holy Spirit is about and what he's doing. He's going to pour out on all flesh. Everyone, from the least to the greatest, are going to now to be able to commune with God. They'll have dreams. They'll have visions. Just like the few were in Israel's history in the Old Testament, only now 
um, it was going to be everyone. So that's the backdrop to prophecy. And you say, well, broaden it out a bit. What, what do you mean? Well, it, it's one of the foundational gifts um, that's given to um, the early church. And you'll see if you read Acts of the Apostles, if you, if you read Ephesians, you know that the five kind of foundational gifts that help the church along, the apostles and the prophets, are right there, together with the evangelists and the teachers and the, the pastors. These are the, the primary gifts, I believe, given in every generation to the church. And we struggle in the Western world with really being able to commune with the Holy Spirit, to hear what he's saying. And so it's not surprising, being as intellectualized as we are, that we kind of struggle many times with the prophetic gift. So God pours out his gifts. God pours out prophecy. And I suppose if I was to give the simplest definition of prophecy, it would be Paul's gift in 1 Corinthians 14, um, chapter 1, where he says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts. Follow the way of love. Follow the way of love. Follow the way of love. Right? You know, love is, a, love is a, a, a motive word, really, because in the Greek it has several definitions. You know, the filial, the brotherly love, the eros love, and uh, most of all the agape love, the love of God that's unconditional. These different definitions in the Greek, but follow the way of love. All that, all that means, and eagerly desire. Now, why would Paul say that, and eagerly desire? Why? Because... So often in the church, we, we, we endeavor, and, I, and you hear people, they follow the way of love. That's the most important thing, and, and, and they're not wrong, are they? But Paul's saying, and desire, if, if you desire the presence and power of Jesus, if you are desiring to move in his spiritual gifts, if you are desiring to prophesy over people, this is a noble desire. These, these desires are given you from God. These are tools, these are gifts that that help establish and build up and grow the church. Nothing to do with you and me. We are conduits of his grace and of his blessing. And so he said, especially the gift of prophecy. So follow the way of love. Keep on doing that and desire gift and especially prophecy. And then the, the clearest definition, the simplest definition, is that the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, their encouragement and their comfort, for their strengthening, for their encouragement and their comfort. And if you will, it's, it's a kind of a, a forth telling or a speaking forth of words that you believe are coming from God. You're speaking forth words um, that you feel are coming from God. Now, Derek Prince labeled this many years ago, the simple gift of prophecy. And he wasn't demeaning this gift at all. This is the gift that personally I, I move in most of all, sometimes telling people that I'm operating in the Spirit, sometimes I don't. But either way, the Holy Spirit will be on me and I can breathe words and speak words over, over people for their edification, for their exhortation, for their comfort, that people would leave me and leave, leave the presence and having a cup of coffee with me, feeling strengthened, feeling edified, feeling encouraged um, after being with me. Not, nothing to do with me, but to do with the Spirit. That's prophecy. And uh, it wasn't to demean it. It, it, it was just to say that the levels of gifting can, can kind of move up. People who have dates and times and can prophesy into the future, forth telling into the future. And that has a lot of problems as well. So before we move on into forth telling the future, I thought let's just have a listen to someone who's uh, been influential in my life over the years, someone who has administrated prophetic people, you might say prophets, to be honest, these people who, who move in tremendous gifting. And he's had to administrate that. So his name's Mike Bittle. Let's listen to him for three or four minutes, and then we'll come back to me, okay? And I, I've been close to the prophetic ministry, kind of up close and personal for right at just under 40 years. I remember when I first came to Kansas City, it was actually 38 years ago, and I... Uh, first became acquainted with Bob Jones and then Paul Kane and then a bunch of others uh, here locally and then around the nation. And I was a little bit deer in the headlights, well, not a little bit, a lot, uh, those many years ago. And I just, because my background wasn't involved in the prophetic ministry. I mean, I like Bible prophecy, but I didn't really like have any experience with people who prophesied, you know, who said I had a dream or a vision. 
And so I was a little bit taken by surprise, but that was almost 40 years ago. So I've had a lot of time to, uh, you know, think it through, reprocess it. Like I remember one time a guy said, man, where'd you get all that wisdom of how to administrate the prophetic? I said, from pain. They said, where'd you get all your pain? I said, from lack of wisdom, <laughs> because I did it wrong so many times. Well, I really stole that phrase from another preacher, but it really was appropriate that you get sometimes wisdom from your pain, but your pain came from your lack of wisdom. I made so many mistakes in the early 80s of misinterpreting or responding over cynical, cynical or over enthusiastic or told too much or told too little. You know, it's an imperfect science, this thing I call it quote, administrating the prophetic ministry, meaning how we walk it out and how we interpret it, how we apply it, how we share it, how we respond to it, understanding time frames, seeing these anointed vessels, but they're imperfect, weak vessels that have flaws in their character, but they have an anointing on their life and they have accurate words, but they have some words they missed it on. And it was like, how does that, shouldn't it just be simple? The guy is anointed, he walks in almost perfect integrity and righteousness, and he never misses anything. There you go, I got it. It doesn't always work that way. Sometimes they're really accurate, but then something they say to, is wrong because they, they're just going on and saying stuff and adding to it from what God gave them, and they have blind spots in their life, and it's like, wait a second, this isn't how I thought it was supposed to be. And sometimes the time frames, it's the right revelation, but the wrong time frame. And it takes uh, a lot of resolve to, to, to stay with. Okay, so Mike knows what he's talking about. These gifts are messy. So when Paul says to the Thessalonians, don't despise the gift of prophecy. Don't grow cynical about it. Um, encourage it, but it's messy and it's messy for many of the reasons that Mike has just mentioned. It's messy because God often anoints people um, who are young or immature with this gift. It, it causes all sorts of problems. You know, when you're trying to lead a church and people are trying to lead churches and these churches are growing bigger, that people come in and, and uh, one minute they're prophesying something and it doesn't happen and they take no accountability for it and the next minute they're on, on a different bandwagon. And people who are new, you know, you, you just can't be too gullible with this gift. You've got to weigh it. You've got to test it. You've got to look at it. You've got to say, you know, you've, you've got to position yourself with your brain working on this gift. But it is nevertheless a gift to the body of Christ. It is an essential gift to the body of Christ. Amos says somewhere, you know, surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without first revealing it to his servants the prophets. You can look that up. Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without first revealing it to his servants, the prophets. That's why we can listen to Becca in a moment, because her dream is a prophetic dream. It's a very real and powerful dream. And it's one of those things that we need to take account of and to listen to. Now, in Acts chapter 21, we have Agabus, who's a prophet, and he prophesies over Paul. And one of, the, uh, one of the disconnects for me between the early church and today's church um, are these roles and offices. I, I've, never really, um, I've never really figured that out, to be honest, um, because I, I, don't see, I don't see the church having prophets, or if there are people who are tremendously prophetic, and you could call them um, a prophet, working... Um, for the same kind of, you know, everyone working together, um, not, you know, myministry.com. You know, <laughs> you know, God does not gift people to start their own myministry.com, whatever that might be, just put in your name. That it, you know, there's nothing wrong. God's given people ministries. He wants to use people. But we've also got to be team players. We've got to be working together. And so here, here is Agabus, and uh, it's in Acts chapter 21 from verse 10. He said, after we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Ju Judea and coming to us, he took off Paul's belt. This is the Apostle Paul. He tied his own hands and feet with it and said, the Holy Spirit says, 
In this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. Wow, what a word. And so there's the revelation. There's the revelation. The revelation, you have a prophet who's proven and tested, I presume. Someone who can hear from God in dreams and visions regularly. Someone who is able to prophesy to someone of the caliber of the Apostle Paul. So, he prophesies to him. Well, is he right, first of all? Um, so there's the, there's the revelation, but th there's two more stages to revelation. And uh, this comes from Mike Bickle. If you, if you look at Mike's website somewhere, you can download his book or read it for free. And that's nice, isn't it? He's not charging you any money to uh, grow in the prophetic. But there's also, and I've been hearing this for 30 odd years, but there's an application, there's a revelation um, but there's also an understanding of that revelation. There's got to be um, an application of that revelation. And so, and, and even before the application, you've got an interpretation. Now, what is their interpretation? When, he, when we heard this, we and the people pleaded with Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said the Lord's will be done. Now, you could argue that Paul was wrong um, to go. I don't think he was wrong. I think Paul's interpretation of that revelation was true. Um, that Paul was being warned by Agabus, prepare yourself. It's going to be really, really difficult. Now, we don't have this at all in our country, but in the early church, it was an honor to be martyred. It was one of the highest accolades you could have as a Christian, that you would be put to death for the name of Jesus Christ. Now, we know tens of thousands of our brothers and sisters now across the world are being martyred for their faith, particularly right now in uh, North Korea, for example, um, particularly um, in northern Nigeria. There are, there are many people out to destroy the message of Christianity and to kill Christians, and uh, many martyrs. We, we, of course, have very little conception of what that would feel like. But Paul does. He's already been through the mill several times. He's already been in very difficulties. He wants to go and wants to do it. So his interpretation is, is that. Now, many times with prophetic words, the interpretation, because God speaks in different ways, um, particularly in dreams, particularly in parables, um, it, it's, it's difficult to get the interpretation. Sometimes you need to tell everyone, sometimes you don't need to tell anyone. Uh, with this dream of Becker's, you know, we held it back for, for a while. We just wanted to look at it and pray about it every which way. And, you know, what is God saying? They're exciting things. Um, that he, he's saying that you'll listen to the dream in a moment. But that you've got, a, you've got the revelation, you've got to interpret that and then apply it. What is the application of what's being said? Now you know that there's a, there's a wonderful verse, I think it's in Numbers, somewhere where um, Aaron and, and, and everyone are hearing from God and talking about Moses and says, yes, I, I speak to you in parables, I speak to you in dreams, I speak to you in dark sayings. But with my servant Moses, I speak face to face. <laughs> very rarely does God speak face to face or Jesus in this way. Uh, very often the revelation that we have comes with a degree of us having to seek after the truth. It comes to us in, in parable form. And just the way that Jesus taught, very often in dreams. And so when you hear dreams, when you hear Becker's dream, and you hear some of the characters in the dream you'd say why would the Lord do that well the Lord often that's just the way that he gives revelation and um, that's how he speaks and so Agabus says the Jews are going to bind you he wasn't right actually it was the Romans who bound Paul and so very often again with prophetic words you can't be gullible you must judge the words and, and even the most incredible person the most incredible prophetic person can be wrong and uh, one of the things I admire um, about anyone is when they, they hold their hand up and said, you know, I gave that word, I was wrong. 
And uh, very often prophetic words, it's timing that is the most difficult. When are these things going to happen? But the Lord, uh, let, let's go back to the beginning, the out point. The Lord loves these gifts. He wants them operating in his church. Yes, they can be messy. I, I don't know a way that you can have prophecy and not fall flat on your face sometimes with a bloody nose. I always think the people who kind of stand to the right or the left and they look at it and they, they look at the immaturity of it, but they're not willing to get in. It's like the river's flowing, the blessing of God, but I don't want to get in. And they can look externally like, well, they know what they're doing. They're a bit more mature, but they're not willing to take any risks. And I want to put my head above the parapet. I want to declare with the faith that I have that God is moving and he's going to move. He's going to move more powerfully. I believe that because... I believe that's what God is saying in this season of lockdown. So let's hear Becca's exciting dream and then we'll come back. Hello, Chris has asked me to share a dream that I had. It was um, quite a while ago now. It was in December 2016. And in this dream, I was in a house and um, I was just pottering about. I can't remember what I was doing and suddenly it started raining and it started raining so heavily that water started coming in through the roof waves started coming across the floor and i was desperately trying to move stuff out of the way and in the corner of the room there was a christmas tree with the lights and i was i was worried about this christmas tree because i thought the water's going to go on the lights and martin riley was there and i looked at martin i said oh no what about the christmas tree and the lights and he kind of looked at me and shrugged his shoulders as if to say, well, there's nothing, nothing that can be done about that. Then I suddenly remembered, because I realised I wasn't going to be able to move this stuff out and it was going to get ruined. And I remembered I had a time machine. I had a device to go back in time. So I said, I know what I'll do. Um, I'm going to go in this device and I'm going to go back in time and then we can be prepared. So I went back in time and I started sorting the house out. I started, there was mattresses downstairs and I started taking them upstairs and I was collecting the rubbish in bags and, and I was just taking one of these bags outside of the house and suddenly Bear Grylls came along and he said, and he was like on a mission, he had a purpose and um, he said, ah, oh, you've helped me before, haven't you? I need your help, come with me. So I went with Bear Grylls and uh, I had to put on a sterile suit. Actually, the first thing I did is I washed my hands. And then he said, you have to put on this suit. And it was one of those sterile suits that you see in movies sometimes. And it covered my whole body. And um, so I put that suit on. And then I suddenly started worrying about the children. And I thought, what are the children doing? Where are they going? And I was thinking about, I have four children myself, so I thought, I've got to go and look at the children. So I left Bear for a minute and went, went over to where the children were. And my son, William, was there. And it was very bizarre because this isn't um, what he's like in the natural at all. But in the dream, he was extremely obese, not just slightly, but he was extremely obese and who's been really, really awkward. And I thought, what is wrong with William? Why is he being so awkward? And who's sitting there and I was trying to sort him out. But while I was doing this, I just had this feeling that I'm supposed to be with, with Bear Grylls. He needs me, I, that I'm not supposed to be here. And I felt like it was a distraction. So eventually I managed to sort William out and went back to Bear Grylls. And then he said, um, we need to give the people some food. And he had these tokens, and he said the, the people need to exchange these tokens for food. Um, so then we were kind of sorting that out. And then um, I was touching this food, and I suddenly realised that one of my sterile gloves had come off. And, uh, and I touched the food, and I said, oh, no, my gloves come off. And, um, you know, I've been touching the food. And then Bear Grylls ate the food that I had touched, and then he died, which was really bizarre. Um, and then I was thinking, oh no. And then everyone was arguing about what had caused him to die. And, um, and I said, oh no, it can't have been that because I ate that as well and I didn't die. And then I woke up. So that probably does sound like a rather bizarre dream. And you might be thinking, why, <laughs> why are you sharing that with us? But I really do believe that this is a dream from the Lord. 
And um, in the dream, uh, I'll just say Martin Riley, I believe, is the Holy Spirit because I've had another dream that he was in and I feel that he represented the Holy Spirit in the dream. Um, the Christmas tree um, with the lights on that short-circuited, because I, I don't know if I said it actually, but the, it, the Christmas tree did short-circuit in the dream as I was worried it would. I believe that that represents um, all the things that we've done to make church look attractive, because um, I believe this dream is about a move of God that's coming. Um, and the floodwaters, I believe, represent that, that move of God that is coming. And the Christmas tree is all those things that we've tried to do to make church look attractive um, and try to do those things ourselves. Bear Grylls is, represents Jesus in this dream. And the thing that really struck me reading back over that dream today was that he had such a purpose in the dream. He, he had a real purpose and he had a mission. And um, he was very focused on that. And, um, and I... The, uh, my son in the dream represented, I believe, because he was actually, uh, there was a group of them and the people with my son were people from church. I didn't recognise them, but I knew in the dream that they were from church. And they were, I believe, that William represented people that have taken the things of God and just not done anything with them. And that's what that kind of obese part of William was in the dream. It represents people that have just taken the things of God and kept them for themselves. And um, that's, yeah, that's what I think William represents. Um, and so I feel the thing is that God has given, he gave me this dream for us to be prepared. I do feel like as well, it's interesting, especially in the times we're in at the moment where things have been shaken. I do believe um, that lots of things that we've put in place to try and make things, th those things have been taken away. We can't meet in church like we've always taken for granted and we can't worship in the ways that we're used to. We're not able to sing. Um, we can't meet each other. And I do feel that there's been a real shaking of those things that we maybe have come to rely on. But Jesus' purpose has not changed. He, his mission is for the lost. And um, in the dream as well, Bear Grill said to me that it, it, he was a doctor in the dream. And he said that, that he was expecting lots of casualties and that he needed my help and he needed our help. And I feel like it's just to remind us um, that this is Jesus's heart. His heart is for the lost. And he says, come, come with me. And he wants us to come and follow him and give our lives for the lost. And there is going to be a move of God that comes. And there's going to be lots of people coming into the kingdom. I really, really believe that and um, that we're to follow him. So the sterile suit, I believe, represents holiness. And no matter how good we try to be on our own, we're never good enough. That, that glove that came off my hand, it, it shows the whole gospel that Jesus had to die for us. We could be the nicest, kindest person we could possibly be, and it's not enough. Christ died for us, that we can take on his righteousness and holiness. And um, so I just feel that that bit where Bear Grylls dies, which did seem really strange to me when I first woke up, but it's a demonstration of the gospel because Jesus did die for us once and for all that we can um, have a relationship with God, the Father, the Holy Spirit, and with him. And um, so it's a real call to holiness. It's that he, he said, come, come with me. And he's asking us, will you come with me? Will your hearts be for the lost? Because that is his purpose and that is his mission. And it hasn't changed. So many things around us have changed at the moment. And it can feel unsettling. And the things that we've maybe relied on that we didn't realise we relied on, they're all being shaken at the moment. He says, come with me. My purpose hasn't changed. My mission hasn't changed. And I need you. You know, each of us, he has chosen from the beginning of time he has a plan and purpose for us, and it's his plan and purpose for the lost and to bring them into the kingdom. So I just, it, it's such a powerful and exciting dream because I, I believe this is, this is true and it's going to happen. And we just trust him and follow him. 
And it does seem funny now because I had this dream, you know, in 2016 and I never would have thought much about washing hands. I mean, I did wash my hands, you'll be pleased to know, but it, it wasn't in the front of my mind in the way that it is in this season we're in now with the coronavirus and having to wash our hands and, and even the sterile suits. It does seem interesting to me now because we can kind of understand and see um, this has been a real time of shaking in the church um, and in what on the things that we've relied on. So anyway, I hope that's blessed you and um, just be blessed in Jesus' name. I just encourage you to dig deep into him in this time. Welcome back. Great dream from Becca. I know um, there, are, there are various things there in, in Becca's dream. You say, well, how, how do you know that's a God dream? And I think you just know God gives revelation this way. Becca is particularly prophetic. Now, she didn't ask to be prophetic. She didn't, you know, she, she loves prophecy. She loves the gifts and, and God has gifted her. She's one of those people that's very prophetic, of which we have a plethora in our church of prophetic people. And they're people who in different ways hear from God. I'm the same. You know, over the years, I've had several times God spoken to me audibly. Several times I've seen open visions. Once, um, you know, other different things that God speaks. But the, the more usual way, if God's speaking um, very often, um, are, are just an inner witness or a dream. So in this period of lockdown, when whichever way I look at it, and I know there's a lot of prophetic noise out there, but whichever way I look at it, God's called time on the church. He shut it down, more or less. And, and I know many people are pretty adamant about getting back. And, you know, I, I want us to gather again. I, I think we can gather again. We can do it safely. And that's important to be able to do that. Plus, as a pastor, I can begin to experiment in how we do church at Baswick in a way that I haven't played around with things for a while. And so we're doing that. We're spending much more time in the presence of God, just soaking and prophesying and open micing and, and these sorts of things. So I, I love all that. And, and the Holy Spirit, I just want him to lead and which way he wants us to develop and what that wineskin can look like as a church. But God shut down the church, hasn't he? And I believe in the sovereignty of God, you know. Read the, every, everywhere I read the Bible. That, and I think, so what if, if the church gets back to normal? I mean, do you not think that some of the bigger churches or the smaller churches, everyone gets back to, so what? And, and I mean, the mission of God is to win the lost. As Becca pointed out again and again and again, the primary mission of God is to win the lost. So what's the primary mission of his prophetic gifts? What's the primary mission of signs and wonders? It isn't myministry.com. It is for the church. It is because Jesus wants people to come into his kingdom. They are weapons of warfare. They're not theatrical gifts that we play with. These are the very things that will transform a person's life in a moment. I remember all those years ago, Rosie put it up on the internet recently, but I remember just touching Rosie on her, her head. She, you know, she's come to church. She didn't believe. She didn't know how to believe. She didn't know what it was. She just wanted to meet some people. Normal people. People who weren't going rip to her, rip her off and everything else. And she liked the the sermon, and as, as I touched her on the forehead, she was completely, radically, completely and utterly changed in that moment. Now that only Jesus can do, but he wants to do it with many more people. That is the power of God that I love. The power of God that saves people, that transforms their lives to get them out of darkness and into light. That's what Becca's talking about, the Holy Spirit's coming. Now, I'm a simple guy. I often say that, and I truthfully am. When God pours out his spirit, things work. When God is not pouring out his spirit, things don't work. It's as simple as that. You say, if only we can get better leadership, better discipleship, if only we can orchestrate this and do that. You know, I, I've heard that for 30 years. I, I've watched the vineyard fail again, fail again, fail. I know it doesn't work. I've looked at our country. When God pours out his spirit, it works. Churches grow. Churches are multiplied. Thousands come into the kingdom. We have to ask God again and again. That doesn't mean we sit back and don't do anything. It just means that when God pours out his spirit, things work. And that's what Becca was seeing. 
She saw the Christmas tree just short-circuited. And I, I believe that interpretation. Anyone out there is welcome to give a different interpretation to that. But for me, the Christmas tree is our attractiveness to the world and trying desperately to be attractive to the world. God is not interested in that, so shut it off. Looks like the season we're living in. So what is God interested in? If he's not interested in our, you know, having great worship at church and great coffee and, and being really nice to everyone and doing great sermons, what is it that God is interested in? He's interested in those black bags, in my opinion. Get rid of your sin. Sort your life out. Draw near to God. And, and, and that, that's the dream. You know? And, and I, I've, I've read revival histories, and, and it always precedes a deep desire for God and holiness. You know, we've been looking at Timothy. We've been reading Timothy. You have to lay down your life. You have to become little. And you have to want him more than you want anything else. There's the birthing of revival. Duncan Wiley said to me a while ago, he said, Chris, you don't need many people to start a revival. You just need a few. That's it. I believe that. You could start anywhere with anyone, but it's on the agenda of God. He wants to pour out his spirit. And as you saw, as Becca interpreted so well, so I won't, you know, I won't go on, I just believe her interpretation. Well, it, you'll, we'll never be holy enough. And there's Bear Grylls, you know, absolutely, and, you know, on a mission, the mission of God to, to save the lost. I've come to seek and to save the lost, Jesus said. It's not the healthy you need a doctor, it's the sick. And our buddy and our friend Martin Riley, of course, rarely faced by anything. And, it, and it's typical that he would be the person to represent the Spirit because he's just unfazed. The Holy Spirit's unfazed, I mean, but, he, but in Becca's dream, that's the man who's been used. And it's kind of what God's, you know, what happens? Well, like, well like things are switching off. The ceiling's going to cave in. The water's running through the home. You know, this, this river of life. God takes over. God takes over. That's what we're praying for. That's the, 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 the overarching, I believe, the interpretation of that is that God is moving. He's moving now. And he's going to increase if we'll turn towards him. doesn't matter how or where. We just ask him again and again and again. And let God shape us and move us. You know, the Holy Spirit is described as a wind. You, you can't be weighed down if you want the Holy Spirit to blow you. Weighed down by sin or weighed down by the past or the old stuff. It's like you, you've got to be ready for the fresh manner of God, which is always the old manner. It's always the, the teaching that's from this Bible, but yet, at the same time, it's fresh. Always understanding God's heart. God's heart for you and me, his grace towards you and me, gosh, he, his love for you and me, that is so overwhelming, and that he wants to use you and me in the fresh move of God. That's it. How exciting is that? How wonderful is that many years ago God gave me a dream and, and he showed me Brighton and I heard the angels in the dream speaking about Brighton that um, they would prefer to be assigned to Brighton and Hove rather than to be assigned to Chicago which is I heard them speaking in the dream and that changed my perspective honestly because then I'd heard from God I'd heard from his angels that God is going to move in our city the struggle I have, to be absolutely honest with you, is that you can only prophesy according to your faith. When I meet these guys in Bogota with Ricardo, or I'm listening to people um, from the South, that these people are not pr praying or, or speaking presumptuously or arrogantly. When Ricardo said to us, uh, as English people, um, and, um, you know, that that they're all speaking to us, that they believe that the UK. I, you know, it, it's, hard, it's hard to have that faith. That God is going to move in our nation in this incredible way. And, and it's easy to say, and many, you know, it's easy to say, but to believe it in your heart, you know. But they do believe it, and they've seen it. They've seen the church grow to 100,000. Imagine. Imagine that. that what, what on earth would you do to... To, to, to see a church grow by 
tens of thousands, not just in their main city of Bogota, but in Medellin and all their cities. They've seen transformation. And do you know what? Just seeing one person transfer, transform makes me cry. Just seeing one person moved out of darkness, one person meeting Jesus, one person whose life was, was a before and now it's an after makes me want to preach the gospel and do it. I can't imagine tens of thousands. And yet I know and believe that's on the heart of God because I've read the Bible, because I know he's a big God, because I know he's sovereign, because I know that's what he wants to do. So we're to pray for that. We're to align ourselves as individuals I'll be going back to Timothy that we become vessels that are noble vessels that can be used in the master's service. But if we'll cleanse ourselves from the latter, if we'll do what Becca saw in her dream, which is utterly, utterly biblical, get rid of the sin, turn to Jesus, turn from our idols, seek the kingdom of God first, and that's it. Then all these things will be added. And and I promise you, you know, just meeting and being in the presence of God and walking with him and, and, and walking with a clear conscience and a Holy Spirit on you, that's worth all the tea in China. And then you can be a vessel that God wants to use. And I believe that's how God's shaping us as a church. I believe that's God, what God is saying to us as a church. And he doesn't need many to do that, just a few. So that's all I've got to say today. I hope you enjoyed listening uh, a little bit to Mike, listening to Becca, and are encouraged to pursue Jesus with every ounce of uh, dignity that you've got, every ounce, every bit of energy you've got. So let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, I thank you that the Spirit is being poured out across the globe today, and we are hungry, hungry, hungry Christians. We know, Lord, that river, that river that runs from heaven. We, we don't want to point, we want to be in that river. As a church, Lord, we're just holding up our church in front of you and saying, pour out your spirit on us, Lord. Pour out your spirit on us, Jesus, that we might bear fruit for your kingdom. So, Spirit of the living God, just be poured out on every person watching this today. Be poured out on every single person, Jesus. Receive the Holy Spirit, church. He's holy. He has plans written over you before the beginning of time. You can turn into your plans or you can have his plans. You can surrender or you can try it your way. Let's try it his way. Let's give up. Let's surrender. Amen. Amen. So God bless you all and... Uh, Looking forward to our next time together and looking forward to seeing as many as you, of, of you as I can um, in reality, either at uh, our venue at Baswick or one-to-ones. See you soon. In the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, go in peace to love and to serve our beautiful Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Jesus, how I love you, here I am before you, longing to be close to know you more. Hear the cry of my heart, the struggle to surrender, come and take your place, take every part.
deep This love that carries me Oceans deep This mystery How wide Long and how high How deep How deep This love that covers me Oceans deep This mystery How wide Long and how high How deep And how wide is your embrace How long the road you walk to bring us home How high the price you paid And how deep the love you've shown May my heart find security In knowing I am loved eternally And how wide Long and how high, how deep your love for me And how wide is your embrace How long the road you walk to bring us home How high the price you paid And how deep the love you've shown And how wide is your embrace How long the road you walk to bring us home
Jesus, how I love you. 